Thank you, John. Thank you to our good hosts at uh, Taleo and DDI for inviting me to speak here this morning. But uh, I'll tell you, uh, I'm, I'm a bit humbled because after hearing the, uh, the quiet but captivating voice of Valerie, uh, the professional polish of Bruce, and the darned English accent, too, that uh, I wish I had, and then the evangelical enthusiasm of John. Now, is it just me, or did anybody else, when he was sitting there going, courage, courage, did anybody else think of the Wizard of Oz, you know, the why? All right. So it wasn't just me, you know. I could just picture that. I'm actually moved by that. <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, you know, courage. You know, what, what was the last time that I was called upon for cor courage? You know, courageous authenticity is something that's on our circle as well. And I'm thinking, courage, what was the last time? And I thought of it. Uh, I recently traveled overseas. And uh, I was in France. Uh, and my French is, you know, we and and I don't even know how to say no. So, <laughs> and speaking of we, um, I had to go to the restroom, and I walked in the restroom, and so I'm sitting in the restroom, and and uh, I could hear all of a sudden all these female voices, and I'm like, oh no. So I'm sitting there and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and it, they're continuing on and on and on. I'm thinking, all right. Drum up the courage, just do it, walk out fast, you know, you know. And so I open up the door, and there's men in there. And I realized that the restroom, the ceiling did not go all the way, or the, the walls did not go all the way to the ceiling. So what I'm hearing is on the other side, all of the activity in the ladies' room, and here I'm imagining and making up things in my mind about what was going to happen when I walk out of the restroom. So, uh, so that, that was my last time to practice uh, courageous authenticity, so... Um, well, I'm going to share with you um, details of a case study. It's a leadership program that we deployed about two years ago, but it's really uh, our company, Diebold, has really been involved in leadership development for about as many years as we've been in business. Um, so we, we focused on that for about 150 years. And uh, so I've seen uh, a lot of different leadership development programs, both in my current company and my previous company, as my, my gray hair will attest to, uh, over the years I've been involved in a, in a great number of different programs. But first what I want to do is give you a little bit of a geography quiz, because it kind of ties in a little bit. I'm from the Canton, Ohio area. Canton, Ohio is, uh, has two claims to, claims to fame. And uh, can anybody name one of them? Football Hall of Fame, right. All right. Pardon me, what was the second one? A, no, I don't think so. I think, it's, I think that's Dayton. Yeah, Harry London Chocolates. I don't know if that's it. Yeah, the, the Football Hall of Fame is, is one. But there's another claim to fame, and I even have some colleagues here that are with me. They may, not be, they may not consider this to be a claim to fame for Canton, but to me it really is. Um, uh, that other claim to fame is the Old Carolina Barbecue Company. Somebody goes, oh, you know, you've been there? Have you been there? Okay. Uh, Old Carolina Barbecue, it, I love barbecue. It is the place to go for barbecue in the Canton area. Well, I got to check off something on my bucket list recently. The chef at Old Carolina Barbecue has been involved in a, in a number of ribs burn-offs. It's only been in business since 2005, but they've won 75 rib burn-offs since 2005. Like every weekend they're going to one. And the chef that's there, every burn off that they've had this year, he's won every one, a major award in every one. So every once in a while, he will offer to the patrons the opportunity to attend a class and he will share his exact recipe with you. Now, the technique that he uses has been perfected over time. So you're, you're not going to be as good as he is, but he, he willingly shares everything with you. So I got to go, and for about three, about three hours, attend a barbecue basics course. And I found out there's a difference between grilling and barbecuing, and I found out all the basics. So let's connect this to what we're going to do today. I'm going to share my recipe 
or Diebold's recipe uh, for a successful leadership program. Now, I'm going to give you all the ingredients. I'm going to willingly share. Now, the technique that goes with it needs to be modified like many chefs do. Every chef cooks a little bit differently. So there are some parts that apply that you like, lots of cayenne pepper, but I don't care for much cayenne pepper. I'd rather put in a little bit of brown sugar instead. So there are different parts that you may choose to apply uh, for your particular needs that you might want to alter a little bit the recipe. But, uh, but again, I will be sharing it with you. So let's move on. So I've, you know, I, I thought about talking about, uh, you know, our previous adventures and, and uh, how can I illustrate what some of our uh, previous ventures looked like. And then it hit me. I, I had the opportunity. I got roped into going. Uh, I have a 15-month-old granddaughter, pride of my life. Um, and I got roped into taking her to this place that I just loathe the idea of going to. Chuck E. Cheese, okay? When I'm at Chuck E. Cheese, and that is not my kind of place, it hit me. I said, there's the illustration of what, time, what sometimes leadership development programs look like or efforts look like. And so, uh, you know, the next slide, I think, illustrates it. Anybody recognize this? It's called whack-a-mole. Uh, you know, the mole pops up out of the hole, and then you whack it, and then another one pops up out of the hole, and you whack that one. And so oftentimes, that's what leadership development programs tend to look like. You know, we've got this problem that lack of teamwork. So you roll out a teamwork training program, and you whack the mole in the head and knock it back down. And sure enough, then there's the communication one that pops up, or, you know, then there's the... Uh, autocratic leader one or whatever that might be. So we, we carried a tool belt with a lot of different courses in it, and we'd roll it out over time, and, and we'd address the issues. They'd have an impact, but it wasn't, it wasn't really a holistic approach to leadership and organizational development. And I think those two things are really tied together, and that's what we're going to talk about, is the integrated approach to both leadership development and organizational development, because you can't separate the two, okay? So, uh, not as a commercial, but just to explain, Diebold is a, is a global company. Uh, we're very much involved in banking solutions, ATM equipment, uh, just about anything that you see in a bank when you walk in from the vaults to the drive-up systems to whatever. Uh, those are solutions that Diebold uh, provides, security solutions, etc. Um, we've got about 17,000 associates, about half of them here in the U.S., and the remainder are spread out over about 80 different countries outside the U.S. Okay, So that just gives you a little bit of background. So I say that uh, to, to explain that we have many of the same issues that, that you folks share in your environments. You know, we've got the same types of departments you have, we have the same type of people you have, and the same types of challenges you have. So I'm a big believer in objective-based learning. So uh, I want to share with you our objective for our leadership development uh, program, and that is to be a catalyst to business growth through development of individuals, teams, and cross-functional organizations. So again, a leadership development program really is of little value if it's not having an impact on the business. So that's our goal, is to have a dramatic impact on the business. But I think everyone understands and appreciates the fact that there is a long runway and a foundation that needs to be laid in order to see long-term growth in the business. We're going to talk to you about our approach to doing this. Um, first thing that we wanted to do was identify uh, what would the organization look like in the future if, in fact, we're successful? What are the behaviors that we're going to see from our leadership team, from our associates, and from the organization? I'm not going to take the time to read each one of these to you, but I ask that you just look at these, and I think you'd identify that these are things that we want to look at. And as John identified, uh, courageous is certainly one of those bullets that we want up there in terms of the behaviors of our, of our folks. So we're going to take a little bit... Uh, a little bit of time this morning to explain to you our approach to, that, that leads to these types of behaviors. Uh, we, took the, 
we, we took the approach of using the McKinsey 7S model. Many of you may recognize this, and I won't spend a lot of time there, but uh, I believe the McKinsey 7S model is one of the best uh, pictorial illustrations of a strong, healthy, and vibrant organization, both of the individuals that lead that organization and of the organizations themselves. And uh, so it starts, obviously, uh, with strategy. And strategy is an area where, uh, where the, uh, the first emphasis is placed. And so we spend a, a good amount of time focusing in on strategy as part of our uh, leadership development program. And I guess the way that I like to look at this, you know, I used to be, when I was, when I was younger, uh, and John talked about his Volkswagen uh, Beetle. When, when I was younger, my first car was, uh, was, uh, was uh, back in the 70s, so I had uh, you know, one of the, uh, the cars with a lot of horsepower to it and all that, and I used to spend a lot of time working on it and uh, working on the engine and all of that. So I kind of look at this as kind of like an engine, a six-cylinder engine. And I remember that, uh, that there was something on an engine uh, that was right in the middle in the front, and uh, that, that component is called a harmonic balancer, okay, a harmonic balancer. And what the harmonic balancer does is all the cylinders, as they fire, what it does is keeps that engine, you know, where, you know the, the, you've got opposing forces and all that. And what it does is it's, it's weighted specifically so that that engine tends to feel and run smooth. So if you think of this as a six-cylinder engine, you notice that there's actually seven, uh, seven different uh, ovals up there. So I put in the middle of that uh, shared values because shared values are really the harmonic balancer in an organization. And uh, I think that that's been presented prior this, to, the, uh, to my presentation that values really are a core area that we focus attention on. So first again, strategy. Uh, we look at the structure, the systems, the style of the management, the staff and the skills. So we want to make sure that we are focusing on all of these areas. So that's why I term this a holistic approach uh, to leadership and organizational development. Our delivery mechanism, uh, I've used an illustration here, or perhaps even a, a metaphor. Um, some of you are familiar with an old proverb about uh, you know, a, a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. And so we use this as a metaphor or an illustration for our leadership development approach because it really is, if you think about it, if you take each one of these strands individually, they have the, the ability to, to withstand so much tensile strength before they break, but if you wrap them together, they work exponentially to strengthen uh, that cord or that line. So the three elements to this that we utilize uh, in no particular order are strategy mapping and balanced scorecards, a program that we call Leader to Leader, and strategic leadership as a third program. And I'm going to explain the elements of that to you. So Leader to Leader uh, focuses more on individual leadership development. And as was spoken of earlier this morning, uh, competency-based uh, competency development is a strong component of that. Uh, the second element deals with uh, sustaining energy and then leading for coaching skills. And I'm going to go into the various elements of this uh, along with the strategic leadership and strategy mapping. So I'm going to just bounce ahead here, and if you want to go back and look at this in the presentation that you can find online. So in Leader to Leader, the first thing that we focus on is leading yourself. Second element is energizing yourself. And the third element is coaching others. In leading yourself, I use the illustration here of a diver uh, going deep below the surface because this really is a deep dive into the inner self. Uh, as was spoken of earlier this morning, uh, self-assessment or assessment is a key element. Uh, I think uh, the uh, I really I wrote down the uh, the quote that. Uh, that, that was said earlier that uh, prescription before diagnosis is malpractice. I thought that was really good. Uh, so first thing we do is help individuals to diagnose uh, what ails them to some degree. 
And we use an extensive uh, uh, 360 uh, feedback uh, tool called the Leadership Circle Profile. We also help individuals to identify what motivates them in learning or uh, to leading others. And then we focus on playing to win versus playing not to lose. And that ties in with courage. There, there are some of us that, uh, that have played ball. I, I played, uh, played baseball and then later in my life played softball. And uh, on, on any given team, there are individuals that play to win and there are individuals that play not to lose. Uh, I remember there was a song, I think, by Peter, Paul, and Mary many years ago about uh, out in right field was the name of the song. It was a song about uh, an individual who played out in right field, and uh, he would just hope that that, in, that ball was not hit to him. You know, and, and, and the chorus was out here in right field watching the dandelions grow. And then, of course, in the song, as it continues, the ball is hit to him, and it's, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do, and all of that. Uh, there are individuals in leadership positions that hope that that ball is not hit to them. And there are other ones that are saying, hit the ball to me, I want to help the team. So we help individuals to identify the benefits of playing to win versus playing not to lose. And then we help them identify specific actions that they can put into a personal development plan and to share with their personal coaching team. We put them into teams of two or three or four uh, that they share uh, their plans with and their feedback with. The second element, it's a bit unique, and uh, there is, uh, we have an individual who is uh, certified by the Human Performance Institute down in Florida, and uh, it is in uh, energy management. And really, it's, I, don't like the term, I don't like the term energy management because it's really not about managing your energy, it's about building and sustaining energy throughout the workday. And this is a tremendous course. It's very different from anything that's traditionally put into a leadership development course. And it deals with the physical aspects of energy management, uh, which includes also uh, not only exercise, but nutrition, and things that will help build and sustain your energy throughout the workday. Emotional energy, mental energy, and spiritual or purpose energy energy. Uh, our elements of, of the energy. And it's a two-day course that we uh, put all of our leadership team through. And then the third element is a coaching workshop, and that's helping others to resolve their problems. There's a lot of emphasis, I think, put into coaching programs. But some of the coaching programs that I've seen tend to focus on, here are the skills that you need to coach others. But there's not a lot of simulation. There's not a lot of practice. We spend two days in simulation practice and observation of coaching skills. And that uh, involves helping others to be able to solve or resolve their, their issues. Uh, you know, we've, we've probably, many, many of us have heard the illustration about someone who walks into your office with a monkey on their shoulder and before they leave, pretty soon they've transferred that monkey onto your back rather than on theirs. Um, this is largely about helping individuals to identify what goals they'd like to uh, achieve themselves and helping them to achieve them. Okay. So that's the first of three elements in our leadership development program, uh, and that is called Leader to Leader. The last bullet in the previous slide talked about change management. This is a slide that we spend a lot of time on, and it's called the Four Quadrants of Change. And as we think about change management, there are a lot of individuals that focus on what's on the right side of your screen. And uh, I apologize if the, if the font is a bit small for those folks in the back, but there's a lot of folks when they think about changes that need to occur, okay, what are the skills we need to focus on for our workforce? Uh, you know, what are the roles and responsibilities of the individuals? What knowledge and tools do they need? Uh, what's the process, the technology? Those are important, don't get me wrong. But when it comes to change management, people are gonna be reluctant to change if it doesn't align with what's on the left side of that screen. If it doesn't align with their values, their commitment, their motivation, their cognitive beliefs, the culture of the organization. You know, uh, 
I, I think of the best way to describe this. I, I know that uh, sometimes there are, you know, the initiative du jour or there are initiatives or new, new focuses of attention that come in every year and you say, well, there, there, there's a percentage of the population that might say, well, just wait, that'll, that'll kind of pass away, you know. So just kind of pretend like you're going along with it for now. In a year, it'll be something different. We just kind of pretend like we go along with it. And, and things that we set forth as strategy really never come to reality because the people really didn't buy into it. The culture didn't buy into it. It didn't fit in with their internal belief system. It didn't uh, resonate with them. So there are sometimes unwritten rules in an organization. Uh, I'll give you one. We call, we call it the 3.3 rule. 3.3, if you, if you think of a 1 to 10 scale, 1 to 10 is high performance, 0 is zero performance. Well, sometimes in organizations there's a culture that says 3.3 is the level that you need to operate at in order not to get fired. And one of the first things that individuals need to do is figure out what's 3.3 because that's where I need to be at is 3.3. Anything less than that, I'm going to get fired. Anything more than that is wasted effort. So sometimes there are cultural norms. And so we, we focus on change and saying, how do we motivate, motivate individuals to try and focus on achieving the upper numbers rather than 3.3? So that might be a, a cultural aspect to that. So we focus a lot on the quadrants of change. Uh, <clears throat> the next thing that, uh, the next set of workshops that we uh, utilize, we entitled Strategic Leadership uh, Workshops. And these are the objectives of it. Uh, so it, it encompasses a, a broad-based leadership skills, many of the things that would be traditionally incorporated into a leadership program. Uh, we help individuals to move from tactical to strategic, uh, cross-functional collaboration and value-based management and application of skills on mid-level business issues. This is a, an important element of our leadership development program is that all the skills that we teach uh, that individuals are learning, I should say more appropriately, are applied in real business uh, practice. Uh, so they're put into, in, we put uh, individuals onto project teams and they're focusing on business issues. Let me talk to you a little bit more about uh, the elements of this. There's six workshops, and here are the six workshops. The first one I've entitled Leader Shift, and that, I guess the best way to, to think about that is in terms of moving from tactical to, to strategic leadership. We have uh, an organization, uh, in my particular learning organization, the average tenure is 24 years. There is a lot of experience in our organization. We've got a lot of folks with tenure. Uh, the 65-year example is, is incredible to me. I can't imagine that. But I had an individual within my, our team that was well in excess of 50 years with the company. And uh, so within, within Diebel, there's a lot of tenured leadership and a lot of tenured management. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of those folks that moved into leadership positions they were very effective managers. But when they moved into a leadership position, what did they become? Very effective managers. They stayed kind of in that same role. And unfortunately, even sometimes when they'd move up two different roles, they'd stay very effective managers. So we call it uh, reaching down into the weeds. What they were doing is they might have been in a director or even a vice president role, but they were functioning effectively as a manager making the decisions that the manager should be making or the director should be making. And uh, that obviously created uh, a, a culture of some sometimes micromanagement. So that was something that was recognized in our organization. So what we wanted to do was focus some attention on moving folks from tactical to strategic leadership. The next thing we talked about, again, leading organizational change. Uh, we talked about leading not only within a specific organization, but across the organization. Uh, this was a key component of our, of our development program, is helping individuals to lead through influence as well as in through uh, direct reports. Developing individuals and teams. Uh, again, this is, uh, I think it's evident at Diebold, but it's probably evident within your organizations that Individuals that lead teams 
are often leading teams that incorporate individuals from across the organization, and it might be situational leadership. So what we're helping individuals to do is focus on uh, leadership through influence and team norms, how to lead to consensus. This is a very, very key component because uh, Diebold, I think, tended to be a very silo-based organization uh, when I first joined them. It was something that I noticed right off the bat that there was a lot of siloed functional knowledge, but there wasn't a lot of cross-departmental leadership and collaboration. So this is obviously something that we wanted to change. And uh, so we talked about not only developing individuals and teams, uh, but cross-functional dynamics. And that's, I kind of lead into the next one there with talking about that. And then cross-functional performance. How do you measure it? How do you improve it? So you can see that three workshops actually work very closely together to focus on cross-organizational performance. And uh, we believe that that is a key aspect of leadership that we wanted to develop within our organization. And as I mentioned, all of the leadership development activities surround on-the-job performance in projects. So everyone that's going through a leadership development program eventually gets involved in various projects. And at the end of the leadership uh, development project, uh, program for strategic leadership, there are project report outs where they come and present to the leadership uh, what the, uh, the impact of their leadership projects were. So again, the first element was leader to leader. That's individual leadership development. The second one is strategic leadership workshops. And then the third element is stra our strategy maps and balanced scorecard. And that talks a little bit more, uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with a strategy map, I put one here that actually works for the learning and development organization. This is the one that we use within our own organization. And you can see that there's uh, elements of this, pardon my back. Uh, we focus on, to be an effective organization, what do we need to do in terms of learning and growth for our own organization? Within the learning and development organization, uh, we want to have highly skilled associates, provide them with the right tools, technology, information, and what type of culture do we need in our organization to be effective? And then from an internal process to meet the needs of our, our customers, what do we need to have for our processes and tools? Uh, what are our customers looking for us to deliver upon? And then what type of financial results do we need to have? So if we look at it from the top down then, in order to achieve the right financial results for the company, uh, we need to meet the needs of our customers. We need to provide them with internal processes uh, that are easy to use, innovative, and uh, deliver the right solutions. And then in order to do that, these are the types of indi individuals we need to have it within our organization. So we spend, uh, we spend uh, time with business units developing their, their balanced scorecards. And this is a real eye-opener for many of the business units. Oftentimes, business units will come to us with a perception that they have a very strong alignment on their goals and on their metrics um, and on the roles and responsibilities of individuals. And what they come to find through the development of a balanced scorecard is that they're not as much in alignment as they thought they were. And through this process, what they find is that they had individuals in the lower part of the organization that were doing work every day, and they didn't understand how they connected to the big picture. Uh, you know, the, the leaders are espousing different strategies that we need to deploy, uh, and they didn't understand how they connected to that. Well, a balanced scorecard and a, st a strategy map is a tool that helps individuals to connect their everyday activities to strategic initiatives. And what we sometimes found is there was no connection. That sometimes that the initiatives that were employed really didn't connect to our, to our strategy. So we re, uh, refocused individuals, put in place new strategies, new initiatives to be able to focus on achieving the desired business results. So 
You talked about the three-pronged approach or the three-fold approach to doing this. I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the results that, that we've seen as a result and then to be able to answer some of the questions that you may have with regards to this. Um, the, the results that we have we're measuring through a, a variety of methods. We have hard metrics that we track, uh, spoken of uh, earlier both by John and I believe uh, Bruce uh, spoke of it as well. Uh, the hard metrics that we're, that we're tracking, we look at uh, our retention rate, we look at the, the uh, first year fit uh, to make sure that we're not uh, putting people in the positions that, that are not a good fit for them. Um, we look at the quality of hire, our internal promotion rate, but we also have them self-report on the impact to the business. We use a, a, a tool by Fort Hill, Fort Hill Company uh, called the Results Engine, and that enables us to capture from the individuals who are going through the program themselves to be able to self-report what impact are they having and to be able to help us to retool our learning programs to meet the needs of the organization. But probably one of the greatest indicators of our success is really our, our CEO. Uh, our CEO carries around with him uh, a little, he carries a portfolio, and with him, he carries his own leadership assessment circle. And he will readily share it with just about any audience he speaks of. And uh, I, would, uh, I would say that uh, Earlier in his career, he was very much focused on uh, the next quarter's business results, as, as many of our uh, executive team were. And over a period of time, as he was involved in this leadership development program, he started to realize that he wasn't laying the foundation for success further down the road. And he is probably one of the greatest evangelists now for the leadership development program that I've shared with you. And he'll readily share with uh, the audience wherever he's speaking, what his own profile is, the areas that he's working on. And uh, then the other thing that he will do is oftentimes sit down with various leaders in the organization and ask them to share what the impact of uh, the leadership development program is doing for them. So leadership engagement is probably the greatest key to success for this program as well. So again, there's uh, we're seeing that we're developing the leaders at all levels. We're developing the right uh, bench strength and the positive impact for retention. And uh, I would share that also that we had some unexpected results as a part of this program. And I'll give you one specific example that came. I, we had a, a leadership, uh, uh, the personal coaching team that I had the opportunity to be involved with, a small group. And as a result of the 360 assessment process, we've had uh, more than one individual, I think there was now two or three individuals, that realized that they were not in the right role, that they were not as engaged as they needed to be. So it was a very deep self-assessment that led them to this recognition. And as a result, some of them have moved on to different careers. Those are not results that we expected, but it was the right result individuals realized that they were really not contributing to the organization to the extent that they needed to be. They were not in the right role. They were not in the right job. Um, they were doing okay as leaders, but they realized that they needed to make some life changes that led them in the directions that they could be passionate about. And other leaders were brought in that were now more passionate about that area of responsibility. The other thing that we're seeing is that personal connections are now leading to business results. Because we're bringing together cross-functional groups, um, what we're finding is that what was once a siloed organization is now becoming a more well-integrated organization, where individuals are making these personal connections as a result of going through the leadership development programs, and as a result now are becoming much more effective in working across the silos, or, or breaking down the silos. And the personal coaching teams that, that are formed really are now taking on a new life. Individuals now have groups that they continue to meet uh, with regularly where they can get feedback, discuss problems, and they can uh, identify opportunities for continued development. 
So all of these areas uh, really lead together to achieving both the expected and the unexpected results. So what I would advocate in, in closing is I would advocate that when you look at a leadership development program, please look at the big picture. I would suggest that you take the McKenzie 7S model that we did and look at the various elements that surround that and say, does your leadership development, if you use that as your lens or your filter, and say, does my leadership development effort focus on all of these areas? Think of it in terms of the six-cylinder engine with the harmonic balancer. Uh, but maybe there's a couple of cylinders that are misfiring that we're not really focusing on. And, and I would tell you that if you're not focusing on all six areas, and if it doesn't all center around shared values, then, then you're not getting the optimal results. I would also share with you, when I talk about that harmonic balancer, uh, the strategic leadership workshop, we do something that's very different there that I would strongly encourage you to consider. The beginning of every workshop, we put up flip charts. We talk about the values of the organization that we say we espouse. And for example, individuals at the manager level and it might have integrity as one of the, the, the values. Uh, that's, that's one of the values. Uh, courageous authenticity is another one of the values. We ask the managers to go up and to put on their, their beliefs or their impressions in terms of their leaders living the values. And they will talk about supportive and non-supportive behaviors for each one of those values. Now what's happened is we share that data with the directors. The directors do it for the vice presidents. The vice presidents do it for the executive team. And that leads to some pretty interesting conversations. What it's also led to is the directors saying to the managers, is that me? I want, I want to see my name next to the supportive and non-supportive. So now the culture has changed where now the managers are having the conversations directly with the directors and saying, here's an area that I think you need to do uh, to focus on some more. Or here's an area that you're doing great. And so now we're starting to see the names put on the charts and the directors appreciating that and the vice presidents, again, sharing that. So in six different workshops, we're seeing, are we moving the needle in the right direction when it comes to values of the organization? Each one of these workshops, these three elements, focuses on values as the fundamental driver of change and improvement in leadership behavior. That is absolutely the right focus. And I believe that the, my pre, uh, predecessors that, that presented this morning, you saw that, uh, I believe, John, in your circle as well, uh, there were shared values or values in the middle of that circle. And I would uh, strongly agree with that contention. So with that, I'll conclude my presentation. And if there's any questions that I can answer for anyone, yes, sir. I have two questions on your line of life. Yes. The people who reassess their career as mm -hmm. they were in the wrong place, was it, was, did they self-select out? Or were they Absolutely. Out? Absolutely self-selected out. Uh, for example, there was a uh, director and accounts payable. Uh, and she said, you know, I'm just coming to work and I'm doing the job, but I don't have passion about it. My people can see I don't have passion about it. This isn't what I need to be doing. She went into an entirely different career that she's always wanted to try. And really part of that was developing the courage to do what she knew she wanted to do. Well, some of that is the coaching and development that we do through strategic. Uh, you know, I, I would say that I, I would add to this. I just focused on the leadership development program. There's a whole lot more process. You know, we, we certainly utilize uh, a, a talent management software from Taleo. You know, we have a strong development uh, initiatives, you know, performance appraisals and things like that, that uh, we hopefully drive those conversations at that time as well. Okay, so that would be the direct, uh, for example, it would be cross-functional. 
uh, might be a couple managers, a couple directors, and a vice president. It, it's just more by random uh, selection than anything else. We do not assign individuals, but let's say this was a leadership development team. Might be usually it's about 25 people that are going through one particular program at a time together. We ask them to sit at a table and say, "Okay, you're one personal coaching team." And uh, the first thing that they do is on the first uh, first evening after they've done their self assessment, they all go around the table and they have five minutes uninterrupted to tell their personal story so their team knows their background. They share anything they want uninterrupted. And so they, they form this bond now that continues on for quite a while. So thank you for the questions. Okay. In the back, yes, ma'am. I'm not sure I can draw a distinction between the two. That's a good. That's a good question. Certainly, what we do in terms of change management, and we talk to them about, you know you need to think about those individual values, and we help them identify, d distinguish some terms what those individual values might be. But it is our, our hope and our belief that the corporate values would very strongly align with those. For example, you know, integrity is number one value. You know, authenticity, courageous authenticity would be another. So there are, there are core values throughout the organization that I think most individuals would say uh, strongly align with their personal values. So thank you for that question. Yes, ma'am. We have, uh, we have two consultants that we work with. Um, the majority of instruction is done, and, and, and actually you led me to a, another point that I didn't bring up, and thank you for that. Uh, so it's being facilitated jointly by internal and external consultants. So we have individuals that are very strong external consultants that we use, but we're also joining them together uh, for the programs with our own internal organizational development folks. But the one element I didn't share, uh, my fear is, is that when you do leadership development programs, will it really, sus not just sustain, but will it grow? So what we're doing in the, in the leadership development programs, we have catalysts or champions that we bring in from business units that now are helping to co-facilitate portions of the program. And they go back to the organization. So they, they co-facilitate during the programs, but the expectation is that they also go back to their business units and they become a catalyst for sustaining and growing the efforts within the organization and also being honest feedback to us and saying, okay, what's resonating and what's not resonating? What do we need to change in our program? So that's a great question. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Mary. Um, do you have any structured follow-up at all with the discipline that have champions, um, things that you would organize Okay, the question was, is there structured follow-up on the personal coaching teams? Do we, do we tell them how often or where or whatever they need to meet? Uh, we do not. Um, in some cases, what we'll find is uh, individuals, uh, my personal coaching team that I'm involved with, will pick a person's house and on a Friday afternoon from 3 to 5, we'll go sit on their deck and use that for our per personal coaching time. Uh, other teams have very different approaches to doing it. They have very structured times. They do it in a conference room, things like that. Uh, so there is, there is not. But I would say that in, in nearly every case, that we do have uh, uh, active coach, personal coaching teams. And we've actually, uh, one of the things I put on there was we're putting together uh, kind of like a quick reference guide where we're taking the best ideas from personal coaching teams and we're putting them onto a SharePoint site and saying, okay, um, if you have an individual who's working on a particular competency Here's some, uh, here's some quick hits. Here's some examples of what it looks like. Here's some things you can do right now that will improve your effectiveness in that area. Here's some long-term learning in that. So there's not only learning within that personal coaching team, but it's being shared across the organization. 
We also bring back together everyone that's involved in the leadership development program twice a year, um, and it's in a CEO-led uh, format that usually lasts about a day and a half. Uh, we had one in May. We're having another one in October. So, again, uh, through the executive leadership team, primarily the, the CEO, we're reemphasizing that we are committed to leadership development uh, and personal development. So, okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you for your questions. I really appreciate that, and thank you for your kind attention. So, so thank you, John. Great job. <clears throat> Valerie, a round of applause.